Thanks for being here today. Really appreciate having you all here uh, for what is an exciting topic and a well-covered topic, I would say, for in the conference so far. So I'm excited to uh, dive into a little bit more and hopefully get into some more tangible aspects of what's top of mind for a lot of us here today. Um, real quickly, before I get started, introduce myself, uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you uh, would you say on at least a weekly basis use uh, ChatGPT or some sort of, uh, on, on a personal basis, you use AI or OpenAI, ChatGPT, Bard, Copilot? Okay. How about within your organizations? Um, does anyone here have like a formal rollout of some sort of AI functionality or capability within your organization, even on a limited test pilot basis? Okay. How many of you have not started anything to do with AI within your organizations, but you're interested in potentially doing it or you'd like to at some point? Okay, great. Well, that's, uh, that kind of fits where, where I thought maybe the audience was as far as a lot of interest, maybe some toe dipping, some trying some things out within AI. Um, both on the personal side and potentially uh, personally as well. And what I find interesting about AI is just how, how quickly it's permeated the mainstream consciousness. I mean, I've never seen a technology like this where just literally, almost literally overnight, within a year, year and a half, you've got just widespread understanding of, of AI. And that's something I've never seen in my, in my career before, even as fast as social media took off or Google or YouTube some of the social media things that we take for granted now, I've just never seen anything catch fire like AI. So this is a, a super exciting time. And um, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 80s, so I grew up loving The Terminator. My favorite book to this day is still 1984 by George Orwell. So I have these, I, I have this, uh, on a personal note, I have a, a, a love of draconian, dystopian types of stories and books and movies. And uh, sometimes AI feels that way to me. It feels like all the stuff I grew up thinking could happen with technology in the 80s might be starting to materialize, hopefully more in a more positive way than some of those, some of those stories unfolded. <laughs> so today's topic, navigating artificial intelligence, a guided boosting productivity in your business. I'm gonna try and get past the pie in the sky, pipe dream type stuff and talk specifically about how organizations are starting to use AI. And of course, I'd love to hear your feedback too because this is, uh, as much as I'd love to say, I'm an expert that knows everything about AI, I do not. And I am learning along with a lot of you on how AI can actually be applied in organizations. So we're seeing the same thing with our clients where some are, are testing out some potential options and use cases for, for AI, but most of them I'd say are struggling with what, what is it, we understand what it is, but how do we start? Where do we, what do we start to do um, to take advantage of some of this groundbreaking technology? So real quickly before I jump in, just a little bit of what we'll cover here today. I'll do a quick introduction to myself here in a moment. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a history and just a high level overview of AI to start. And then I wanna get into the benefits and opportunities of artificial intelligence. I wanna talk about how AI is affecting ERP systems in general. And then I'm gonna talk about how AI is actually being used and deployed with Epicor customers. So I wanted to use, because this is an Epicor conference, wanted to talk about how Epicor is building specific functions using AI and some of the use cases around that. I also wanna talk about for a moment, a few moments, the organizational change and the people impact of AI. So what is it we should be thinking about, not just from a technology perspective, but also how we enable the organization to not be afraid of AI and actually get the value out of AI that we hope to see from it. Talk a little bit about the challenges of AI and some of the ethical considerations, and then I wanna leave you with a roadmap for how to actually move forward with, with continuing your exploration and potential adoption of AI. And then, of course, any questions along the way, I actually do not mind at all. In fact, I prefer if I get interrupted because it makes it less boring for me. I, I get tired of hearing myself after a while, so I'd love to hear your questions and, and shift gears at any point. So feel free to pop your hand up. I'll keep an eye out for any questions you might have along the way, or we can ask, uh, cover questions at the end as well. So my name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of a company called uh, Third Stage Consulting. Third Stage is an independent and tech agnostic consulting firm. We're not affiliated with Epicor, nor are we affiliated with any software vendors. Uh, we help clients select and implement different types of enterprise technologies, whatever that right technology or technology set is for them. And one of the services we provide is AI strategy and AI implementation, in addition to doing your traditional ERP, CRM, human capital management, supply chain solutions, uh, MES, all that stuff. Um, today, we're gonna, um, we're gonna focus on manufacturing. Uh, how many of you are in the manufacturing and distribution space? Okay, good because I'm gonna talk a lot about manufacturing. So I was hoping I'd see a lot of hands there. Uh, most of our clients are in the manufacturing and distribution space at Third Stage Consulting. Uh, we're not limited to that space, but I'd say 60 to 65% of our revenue comes from manufacturers and distributors. 
uh, most of them complex, mid-market to upper mid-market, uh, a lot of them global organizations. Um, and we help, uh, like I said, we help clients select and implement different types of technologies. I've been doing this for 25 years. I started off at one of the big four consulting firms and uh, started third stage in 2018, um, really as a way to provide a tech agnostic option for clients that wanted help with selecting and implementing different types of technology. I felt like there was a need to have someone that really represented clients' best interest wasn't out there trying to sell a certain product. So even though I'm not talking about Epicor today, even though I think Epicor is a great product, I am not affiliated with Epicor, Epicor does not pay me, I don't make money from recommending Epicor or any other product for that matter. But uh, so with that being said, I do wanna talk about from an agnostic or a, a technology independent perspective, uh, hey, how AI is affecting ERP and Epicor in particular. Most of my background is, um, is actually in uh, change management. I started off my career as a change consultant uh, within an SAP practice of one of the big four consulting firms. So it's kind of a funny story. I, I was hired out of grad school at a very young age, right, right when I finished grad school, uh, by this big four firm. And I thought I'd be like a strategy, supply chain strategy type consultant, because this is back in the late 90s and supply chain was starting to become a pretty cool discipline, or at least I thought it was. And um, so I wanted to be a supply chain strategist. And, but my partner at, at uh, PwC, where I started, said, I have a different plan for you. You're gonna go get certified in SAP and you're gonna do SAP implementations. And I kicked and screamed and said, I don't wanna become an ERP consultant. That's the last thing I wanna do. I wanna do supply chain. And she said, too bad, you're you know, low man on the totem pole. You're, you're gonna go to get certified. So I decided to keep my job and go get certified in, uh, in SAP. But I bring it up because I, I resisted at first, and which is kind of strange saying that now because I love doing what I do in the ERP consulting space, but I originally did not want to be an ERP consultant. Uh, because I thought of myself as more of a business change strategy consultant. So what I negotiated over time is, hey, I, I've got this technical knowledge now. I know how to configure ERP systems. What if I become a change consultant applying that technical knowledge to change management? And that's how I ended up start, sort of going down the path of a, of a more change and operations focused side of, of ERP. So most of my background comes from a lens of business first, organization first, and technology come, coming behind that as an enabler. I also do quite a bit of work as an expert witness too. So when there's lawsuits or failures um, in the ERP space, um, I will testify in court. Although I, I do have to say, because it's an Epicor conference, I've never been retained for an Epicor related lawsuit. I don't know if that means they've never been sued, but they've, I've never had to testify in an Epicor related legal dispute. It's usually SAP or Oracle, not to, not to name names, but it's usually SAP or Oracle. <laughs> So um, just a quick history and understanding of, of artificial intelligence. Again, it's, it's, AI is so fascinating because it's been around for a long time, but it's just now where people get it. I mean, people are using it day to day. Um, I knew when I saw, if, has it, have any of you seen the South Park episode with AI? Does, it, does anyone watch South Park just in general or have seen episodes? And for those that don't watch it, if you find it offensive, I'm sorry, but I do watch it. Uh, I enjoy that show, I enjoy that kind of humor. Um, but when I, when I saw that episode where on South Park, which is a, usually they're pretty good at keeping up with current events and pop culture and things like that, when they had an episode dedicated to AI and ChatGPT and they wrote the episode using ChatGPT, I knew that, you know, obviously this, is, this has hit the mainstream and this is top of mind for a lot of consumers, um, not just businesses. And so um, I, I think it's uh, funny because that, that show actually, in the episode, just to give you a quick synopsis, they talk what happens in the show is one of the main characters who's a kid has a girlfriend who, who doesn't um, think that he's communicative enough, so he decides to use ChatGPT to text her. Basically, all the text responses, he uses ChatGPT, and he doesn't even read what he's sending back and forth, which is kind of funny, because I actually tried that with my wife, and she did not find it as funny as it was in the, uh, the episode. <laughs> and she knew ChatGPT wrote it, too. She said, you used ChatGPT to write that, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Um, but the other part of the, the story of this episode, too, is that the kids start using ChatGPT to write, to write their homework, and then the teachers start using ChatGPT to grade the homework, and then the principal tries to crack down on ChatGPT, and the teachers don't want them to crack down on it because they're using ChatGPT to grade the homework, and they don't really care that the kids are using <laughs> ChatGPT to write the papers. So it, it was, it's actually a really funny episode, but it's, it's actually a good story of how AI not only permeates pop culture in the mainstream, but also how we could potentially be using AI in very creative and non-traditional ways. I'm not suggesting you start texting your spouse using AI. And in fact, I highly uh, discourage you from it based on my personal experience, but it is an option if you'd like to go that route. Um, so AI has been around for a while. It's just now permitting the, the, the main sort of uh, 
pop culture or mainstream culture. But if you think about it, you know, anyone who uses Facebook, you've been using AI for a long time. You may not know it, and it may not be you that's actually using it, but AI is being, you're interacting with AI whether you know it or not, whether you're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, a lot of e-commerce sites like Amazon have been using AI for a long time. So AI has been around for a while, but I think what's interesting is now we are becoming users of AI. Now we have options and tools that we can directly use AI that we haven't been able to in the past, which is why it's so top of mind for a lot of organizations. And because so many of us now are using ChatGPT, even on our personal level, to get ideas for what to cook for dinner or whatever you might use ChatGPT for, now there's a shift in the B2B space or in the business technology space where organizations are now looking at ways that we could potentially use AI to add value to our organizations. And that's what, what, uh, where we're at today. And the other thing that's been around for a while is machine learning. So I know Epicor and other software vendors have been investing heavily in machine learning for years now. And machine learning is a subset and a component of artificial intelligence that, again, has been around for a while, but we're just now getting to the point where instead of machine learning being happening behind the scenes, now we've got AI tools that are more, that we can interact more directly with to do different creative things with, and we'll talk about some of those things. And then of course, there's a lot of unanswered questions about AI too. So as we look to where we are today and where we're headed, I'm gonna come back to this point, the last point on this slide, I'll, I'll come back later. But we also have to think about the ethical considerations and some of the, the weaknesses or the dark sides of AI. What does it mean for potential job loss or job displacement? What does it mean for potential discrimination in society? Is, is there any sort of racial bias, uh, sex bias, or gender bias, I should say? Um, is there anything like that that would p uh, potentially create biases or problems in society or create uh, more problems in society? So those are some things we've got to think about. That's sort of where we're at with AI. But what are the benefits and opportunities? That's really what I want to get to here today is I want to dive into and drive down into how AI is being used from an operational perspective now, and then also how can we decide how we're gonna deploy AI in our organizations going forward, knowing that there's a whole sea of opportunity and we're not gonna boil the ocean overnight, so how do we get started? How can we take some incremental steps towards uh, doing some use cases and beta testing of AI capabilities? So let's start with the benefits and opportunities though. Some of the ways that we're seeing organizations use and even just think about AI when they're, when they're trying to think creatively about how they're going to start to deploy AI throughout their organizations. One of the first things that comes to mind is it provides a better work experience potentially for employees. Now they can use these tools to do a lot of the work that they had to do manually, a lot of the grunt work they had to do to gather data, to analyze data, and it really speeds up the process to where we can get more productivity and more effectiveness out of, out of employees. So there's a, there's a better work experience potential there. There is a potential perceived fear that goes along with it. I'm gonna come back to that because there is a dark side to it and it's not all sunshine and rainbows. And I think there's a sort of underlying potential dark side that needs to be addressed. We'll come back to that uh, later in this presentation. But another area is a better customer service. By, by being able to manufacture the right products and have them in the right place at the right time to the customers and or doing everything that leads up to that, ordering the raw materials at the right time, um, having the right demand forecast, being able to production plan and, and run MRP more effectively. Those are all things that AI can help enable, and there's a lot of different use cases and a lot of different options for use cases within the manufacturing space. But all of that ties back to how do we provide a better customer experience uh, to, to our customers. Another example, speaking of customer experience, another way that you all have probably seen AI in action is if you ever order products off a website like Amazon or even at any of the major retailers, when you go in and you buy something, it gives you recommendations for other products that could be uh, purchased. And they actually have been using machine learning and AI behind the scenes to create those personalized recommendations for you based on mass amounts of data that they've been gathering on consumers throughout the world. And that's how they are able to make those recommendations. So we've always had that sort of customer experience on the Amazon side of things or the, the B2B, or the, I'm sorry, the B2C sides of things. But now we're, we, we sort of have that expectation that businesses should be able to provide that same sort of capability to each other and also uh, you know, industrial manufacturers and manufacturers of widgets, whatever you might manufacture, um, your customer, whether it's B2B or B2C, is going to expect that sort of Amazon type of experience and that's what AI uh, enables us to do with this widespread adoption that's happening now. 
supply chain management, same thing I mentioned, the raw materials, and MRP, and some of the manufacturing specific uh, processes. But you also have um, just the way you source products, um, how you're shipping product, all your freight and logistics, being able to optimize all that. It's something that a lot of supply chain managers struggle with, but now AI doesn't make it perfect, doesn't make it easy necessarily, but it makes it easier and provides a lot of uh, increased effectiveness there. And then the last two bullets are more like possibilities of what we could start to see and where we could see AI potentially helping society in general, outside the manufacturing space even, just in our lives in general. It, it has the opportunity to provide better healthcare outcomes. I mean, that's one that I'm personally excited about because I think AI could really change the way healthcare is and, and some of the outcomes and effectiveness of healthcare. And just imagine if all of us in this room plus several million other people throughout the world were able to use their personal health information and use that data and, and have AI learn from that data to figure out what we're at risk for, or if we have some sort of symptom, what's the most likely out, what's the most likely synopsis? And right now we're sort of limited by silos of data in the healthcare system uh, and doctors' siloed knowledge of different uh, disciplines within medicine and healthcare. But AI suddenly could provide a way for us to have a better uh, healthcare system throughout the world. And then climate change as well, being able to do things, whether it's climate change or anything societal that we want to improve as a, as a society. I'm not, I don't want to suggest that AI is going to fix all the world's problems, but AI is a, is a way and a possibility that, again, using mass amounts of data will help us better understand climate change and where we do or don't have the most impact uh, with that. So those are just a few examples of how AI is potentially improving not only manufacturing, but also the world around us. So now let's talk about how AI is changing ERP systems. So that's just high level what's happening in the world in general. But if we look at AI system or ERP systems in specific or in particular, let's talk about how AI is changing uh, this side of this part of the world as well. The first is, is AI is now becoming incorporated into ERP systems. So rather than having an ERP system over here and a separate AI tool over here, now AI and ERP are starting to come together. And again, this is sort of a natural evolution that had already started with machine learning. Um, what is it, the optical character recognition, like with AP processing, for example, um, that sort of machine learning uh, aspect of being able to process and automate processing of invoices, just as one, one example. That's been in the works for some time now, but now AI is really sort of uh, fast-tracking different ways that ERP systems can provide better capabilities than it ever has before. And part of it is because it's not just about the ERP system now. Now it's about ERP systems and actual outcomes and activities that are happening within those systems, and AI is a, is a way of taking data and actual real-world stuff that's happening, and it's, trans it's translating that into actionable stuff that we can do as an organization. So AI and ERP are really starting to come together and that combination of ERP and AI and data, which is gonna be the next point here, we throw data into the mix. If we can do those three things really well, that's gonna be a super powerful combination that uh, it's a great opportunity for us as leaders to really get ahead of the competition now for once, instead of trying to keep up or trying to upgrade off of a really old system. Now we can think more strategically about maybe some low risk, high value kinds of ways that we could be using AI to, to further whatever our competitive advantage might be. The other way that I, I really find fascinating that AI is transforming ERP systems is it's creating this hyper focus on data, which for a long time has been overlooked and I've always wondered why don't organizations think more about data? Why don't they spend more time cleaning up data and, and making sure they get value out of the data, because that is an asset, it's a competitive advantage potentially, all the data you have as an organization. But so many organizations just either don't spend the time to clean up their data, nor do they spend the time to put governance in place to make sure that the data stays clean and that you have the proper data and people aren't making mistakes up and downstream throughout the, throughout the supply chain or the value chain. So now with AI, because AI has to have good data, now organizations seem to be reprioritizing the importance of data. And that's the good news too, is I think it, it, it was always gonna be a benefit to an ERP system to have better data, but now we have a real good reason, which is AI just isn't gonna work, or it's not gonna work well if we don't have good data. So that's another sort of secondary exciting outcome that, that we're seeing right, right now.
I think it's, it's super important. So the question is how important is it for AI to have real-time data instead of just batch processing of you know, a day or two later? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's important. I mean, it, of course it depends on what part of the business you're talking about, what industry you're in and what you're trying to accomplish with, with it. But you know, I, my view is if the faster and more accurately you can get data to an AI model, the more, the more value you're gonna get out of it. Um, you know, if you think about a machine, you know, if, if, you, if you have a machine that's on the verge of a breakdown or there's some sort of risk happening because you're, you're uh, you know, you've, you've had too many uh, cutovers or changeovers on the shop floor in a day and maybe there's too much wear and tear on a machine for whatever reason, um, you're working extra shifts or whatever the case may be, um, to be able to predictively identify the risk and identify when maintenance should happen on a machine, for example, on the shop floor, that's gonna rely on real-time data and you don't wanna get that data late and have the AI be out of sync with when. Right. Right, yeah, exactly, you want correct data and to have correct data it has to be real-time or else you're operating off of a flawed assumptions there. So that's a great question. And I think there's, again, it's not just improving data so that we can use AI, it's also improving data because by the way, we just need it to make good business decisions and understand what's happening in our businesses. So I think this is a great opportunity right now where we're at to sort of kill two birds with the same stone. By cleaning up data, we're getting better prepared for AI, and we're just gonna get more value out of our ERP system even if we didn't use AI, or in areas where we aren't using AI yet. So there's a lot of benefit to, to a data focus, and I can, see, I can see why so many kids now are going to college and, and trying to get into data science. I think it's a, it's a great field to be in. I think there's a bright future for it as well. As far as getting the AI more data and more correct data, where do you find the balance where it becomes more of this uh, diminishing returns on the human's part of treating the data that's submitted. It's a great that happens? It's a great question. Um, I don't know I don't know that there's a point of uh, I don't know that there's a, such a thing as too much data within AI miles or at least I haven't seen that yet. Um, but to your point, as far as gathering the data and finding it, I mean, I would hope that in most organizations that once you find and map the data, whatever it is you're trying to get, it, it sort of runs on autopilot and then you've got that access to the data within the AI model. So I, I think it's valuable. The more data you can give it, I think it's only going to benefit. Now, of course, some data is going to be more valuable than others and not, it's not all created equal, but I think having a complete picture of your operations and having all the data through your, through your entire organization, I, I think is is critical and, and so much of data cleanliness is, is a cultural thing that it's hard it's actually hard to just fix data in certain spots or to only use data in certain parts of the organization it's actually easier in some ways just to create a broad culture of data governance and understanding the, the importance of data and, and treating data as a real company corporate asset too so i i wouldn't put any limitations on the amount of data you, you feed into an ai model especially when you look at you know, all the data on the shop floor with sensors and machines and all the IoT, Internet of Things stuff. And I feel like there's a lot of trends with IoT and Industry 4.0 that haven't really materialized largely because we haven't had the right tools and or we haven't had the right data. So now if we can take the data and, and consolidate it and centralize it and run it through these models, I think now you can really start to think about Industry 4.0 and um, like sort of smart factory concepts and things like that that are big buzzwords right now, but they haven't really materialized for a lot of a lot of manufacturers. There's also employee efficiency. That might be the, the biggest, most immediate low-hanging fruit for AI right now is, is just being able to make employees more efficient. Giving them tools to where they don't have to search down it, or search for information or track down information. Now they can be analyzing and thinking and spending more time applying that tribal knowledge they've spent years building. Now they can actually think and make decisions and do more decisions and make more um, progress towards accomplishing company goals, because if you think about it, even though employees take pride in their jobs for the most part, um, I think even if someone who's, who's doing things that could be perceived as low value add, it's value to them because that's their job and they probably take pride in it. So for a lot of, a lot of uh, employees, this is an opportunity to not be dismissive of the work they've been doing all this time, but now to really take their strengths and let a computer and let AI take a first pass at some of that analysis and data consolidation and decision making and allow the human or the employees to, to validate and be more of, more of a, a director of, of AI. It's almost like you've just hired a, a staff of a bunch of people 
that can support each of your, your employees that are, that are doing day-to-day -day transactions. So really scaling up and allowing employees to do more and getting more value out of them, out of them is something that's uh, very important with ERP systems and AI, as well as employee effectiveness. So if you think about things like um, financial planning, demand planning, MRP, all the material resource planning, those are things that are prone to human error, and those are things that are limited by human knowledge. But now if we use AI to help take a first pass at MRP or take a first pass at, our, at next year's uh, forecasted sales by SKU, um, those are things that uh, now it's probably gonna do a better job in, in many cases than any human could, largely because it can process so much data and it can base things on statistics and algorithms rather than just human, human knowledge and intuition. So the beauty is now we can take better data, better outputs from the AI models and humans can actually become more of a, a decision maker and a validator of some of that, that information. I was uh, hosting a, a panel discussion this morning and the gentleman is in the room, I don't wanna call him out even though he's sitting right over there, um, right in the middle on the, on the end there. Um, he, he was a CIO panel and he, he used a, a sandwich analogy and I got permission from him to license me the rights to use this analogy in this presentation right before I came up here. But it's a, it's a, his sandwich analogy is really good because he, he said that AI is a lot like a, a sandwich. And on the, the, the two buns, the top and the bottom bread, you have the human interaction and the meat of the sandwich is the actual AI processing and all the analysis that it does. And then the top of the sandwich is, is the human directing and putting parameters in place for AI as far as what it wants, what you want AI to do. And then the bottom of the sandwich is the anal analysis of the output and the decision making, the human intervention or whatever you want to call it that goes along with that. So I thought that was a really nice analogy to where now the meat of, of manual work now gets done by AI and humans can focus on uh, completing the sandwich, if you will. So I, I thought that was a nice analogy that sort of describes how humans and, humans and uh, uh, AI and technology can interact and, and how important it is to complete the sandwich. Now, the only flaw with this analogy or this metaphor is if you're, uh, you know, if you're on an Atkins diet and you're trying to cut your carbs, you probably don't care about the bread, but we'll set that aside and not get too, uh, not overthink this, which I tend to do, but I think it's a, it's a great analogy. Um, how does AI account for external factors? So in your, your analogy, uh, you know, there's a wheat shortage, so it, it's gonna affect the, uh, the top layer of the bread or something like that, or there's a, a, an international conflict or, you know, something as simple as a strike. How do you, how do you incorporate that in terms of being able to predict? So, sort of like um, unpredictable macro events that... Which, like, which tend to really throw things into chaos, right? I mean, that's... Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you're never going to be able to predict the next COVID or a strike in, in most cases. I mean, maybe some of that you could potentially predict if... Uh, you know, I don't know if there's a way yet to where, you know, if, if you're an organization that's unionized and you know there's a risk of a strike, I don't know if you could factor that into the AI models or if you could direct an AI model to account for that risk. But let's just say it's a risk that you, you, you really can't predict, like another COVID or, or some other war or whatever it may be. I think the key is not to say we can predict that and, and avoid the impact, but instead it's to say by having AI, we can identify what the risks are if something does happen. And then when it does happen, it allows us to respond faster and, and be more effective in how we respond. So you can't avoid it necessarily in some cases, but I think it can make you as an organization more flexible. I hate to use the word agile because it's so overused, but if you become more agile, you become more nimble, you can move faster. I think that's the real advantage and that it's sort of a cultural shift that goes along with that too. Quick question. When you talk about the data, you're saying, hey, gives a refocus on the data in terms of governance and the struggle and all that. And we've seen a value creation proposition or, or use for AI in terms of helping eliminate governments or helping eliminate data scrubbing. Yes. So data scrubbing for sure. Um, we've we've seen a, a use cases already where um, you know organizations are able to use AI to um, merge records to get rid of duplicate records. Um, if, if there's something that's in a wrong format, you can identify, you know, the, the master data that might be incorrect or master data that's not being used anymore and you clean that out. Um, even just reorganizing a chart of accounts or, or things that, you know, you, you might go through in a transformation. Um, also, like, um, I know it's not data related, but even just development 
of code or development of configuration of software, things like that. A lot of that's becoming automated now. Um, and I think what will happen is you'll see a lot of that, again, grunt work that's being done, hands-on grunt work to configure and build and integrate and test and things like that. And that's all stuff that's ripe for automation with AI. And of course, now we've got to think about what's the impact on you know, humans. Are, are people going to lose their jobs? What about all these offshore centers that big organizations have created, big tech organizations have created over the years? And you're already starting to see some of the fallout from that. A lot of big tech companies have had big layoffs in the last several months because they're anticipating the efficiency gains that, that come along with, with AI. So um, does that answer your question? You bet. Great questions. Thank you for asking. I really do enjoy having questions mid-presentation instead of all at the end. So those are, those are some of the ways that uh, AI is transforming ERP systems. But I want to talk a little bit about some use cases of how Epicor in particular has built um, AI into some of their various tools in the manufacturing and distribution space, but mainly manufacturing. And these are things you may have heard of, you may have heard about in other keynotes. You may have seen some of this out on the, in the solutions pavilion. I know they're showing a lot of this downstairs, which is super fascinating. And I look forward to spending more time there again today uh, and tomorrow to get more, you know, more of insights into what, what Epicor is doing with this. But, you know, some of the ways that AI is being used within Epicor and some other software vendors as well, too, in, in many cases, um, one is inventory forecasting. So just being able to get your arms around you know, when you need certain raw materials or finished goods or both, and being able to make those predictions, not just based on general, you know, straight line seasonality type analysis, but more based on internal data from your organization, but also uh, external data as well. I think the beauty of where we're at with AI and the cloud combined, this is another, I'd say, secondary benefit of AI, is it is pushing a lot more organizations to the cloud, and it's making cloud investments a lot more justifiable because in order to take full advantage of AI, you need all this data in a cloud environment to capture not only your own data within your own four walls, but training the AI models that the vendors have in the cloud using data from other customers as well. Now, of course, there's data privacy considerations, I, I believe, uh, I'm not an attorney, but I believe Software vendors typically need to get uh, approvals from customers to be able to use their data as part of the larger uh, AI models. Um, so I, at least I, I know that's the case with other, other software vendors. They've said that they have to have written approval um, and agreements in place for that. But the beauty of this is that now by moving to the cloud, you have the option of having mass amounts of data and access to mass amounts of data that you would have never had before. And not that you're going to have direct line of sight into your competitors' books, your competitors' uh, confidential information, but you will be able to, in this example, use Epicor not only based on forecasting based on your parameters, but also based on similar manufacturers that have similar um, outside factors that, that influence their, their inventory, uh, inventory needs. So inventory forecasting is one area that I know Epicor is investing heavily in AI, and they're starting to see some use cases of customers actually using it for more accurate inventory for, uh, forecasting. AP automation, I'd say, is a little more mature with Epicor and other systems as well with, with AI because they've been using machine learning for some time to, to automate um, the processing of invoices and really focusing on exceptions rather than humans approving every single, um, every single invoice themselves. Financial planning and analysis, being able, being able to forecast revenue, forecast um, cash flow, forecast obviously sales uh, demand, which in, influences revenue and all your other uh, financial results and plans. So FP&A, you're starting to see some use cases of AI being built into that as well. And again, if you look at this list as I'm going through them, they're all things that require a lot of data and typically requires a lot of manual processing and thinking to try and figure out the answer to these, these challenges. Uh, predictive maintenance assistant is another one that Epicor is investing in and, and has capabilities around, which is using data points from clients or their customers throughout the world that have equipment and have uh, maintenance needs and being able to predict when certain machines or shop floor machines are going to require maintenance or predict when they might fail or at risk of failing. So that, that uh, being able to predict uh, potential downtime and getting ahead of that um, is, is something that the predictive maintenance assistant can do. Predictive inventory assistant is another, just uh, again, back to the inventory forecasting piece, identifying when inventory needs to be ordered and, and identifying potential risks and, and stockouts. 
Um, back to the question around, you know, how do we how do we work around things we can't predict in big unpredictable macro events? Um, let's just take COVID as a, as an example. You know, when COVID hit, it really exposed the vulnerabilities of the global supply chains because so many organizations had you know a single point of failure in the supply chain. It was a it was a raw material provider or some sort of supplier overseas. Um, there was a long lead time that was involved from the time it hit the water until it got to um, to the customer. And AI wouldn't have solved that completely, but what AI can do is identify where there's risks like that. Like it might be functioning fine right now in our supply chain, but if another macro event does hit, where are the vulnerabilities in the supply chain? Where do we have a single point of failure? Where do we have uh, potential quality issues? Where do we need um, you know, potentially to diversify our, our, uh, our supplier base? Do we need to have options to bring suppliers um, onshore to onshore suppliers rather than relying just in, in offshore providers? So those are all the kinds of things that uh, some of this inventory management capability and the forecasting capability can help us uh, solve and, and answer for. I talked about MRP, being able per, to optimize how manufacturing schedules run. Again, that's something that's oftentimes very manual. Even companies using modern ERP slash MRP systems find themselves doing a lot of manual intervention, a lot of manual analysis, but AI not only streamlines that, but it potentially makes it more effective because again, we have our own data, but we also have other data from other customers in the cloud, but also even third-party data that isn't from a customer. Um, you know, things like the economic indicators and things like that can also be used, those data sets can be used to train the AI models as well. Configure price quote is pretty cool. I, I like what Epcor is doing with this because you know, configure price quote for complex make to order manufacturers. How many of you are complex make to order, engineer to order types of manufacturers? Maybe half ish, 40%, 50% of you maybe. So CPQ is, is pretty cool because not only does it help you streamline and set the parameters for how you can create and configure a product, but it's also using AI to create some of the other downstream deliverables or processes that need to come from that. So creating a bill of materials based on whatever order you've created, uh, for example, is, is one, one area. Creating a CAD drawing uh, automated based on what you've captured in the CPQ. Those are pretty cool, pretty uh, material efficiency gains that a lot of manufacturers can gain because that's something that's being done manually right now. In many cases, dual entry and dual recreation of, of information that starts to go away and become streamlined as a result through that CPQ capability. And then knowledge assistant is another one, just being able to find, just being able to find the information you need without having to memorize what screen to go to, without having to create a new report necessarily, and having that more conversational AI uh, component that we're used to with ChatGPT, for example. That's something that's really changing Epicor as well as other uh, ERP systems in the market. So I want to talk just quickly about managing change through AI integrations and AI implementations. And when we're thinking about AI, the one thing we do have to think about is that this is another technological change. It is probably more threatening in many ways, potentially, in terms of perception to employees than other types of technologies. It reminds me a lot of, uh, again, being a child of the 80s. I remember when robots and robotics were first starting to emerge within the business world. Uh, both of my parents, when I was uh, a kid in the 80s, they both worked at digital equipment, which no longer exists, but they made computers back in the day. And uh, I remember my dad, you know, who was a blue collar worker, was worried about um, what that might mean to his job, you know, because the robots were starting to build all the stuff that he was manually, you know, physically doing. So we do have to think about how, how AI is perceived and how organizations and people might start to resist it, even if they're not doing it for nefarious reasons. So we have to train employees. Why are we doing this and how is this going to make their job better? Probably most important, we have to have a clear plan, and I'm jumping ahead to another point here, but we do have to have a clear plan and vision for how people's jobs are gonna change. I think this is gonna be really, really important for AI adoption and, and deployment because if people worry that you're gonna automate a certain percentage of their job, they're gonna worry that they're not as valuable to the company, they're gonna worry that they may lose their job, they may worry that all the things you value about them and you've since automated or you have AI doing for you now makes them less important to the organization. And of course, there may be situations that where that is true, but I'd say in most cases, it's probably going to be an augmentation and, a, and a, an opportunity to allow employees to do more and to be better at their jobs and to be better performers. 
But the problem is, if we don't paint that vision of what that means, how are we going to do that with AI? How are we going to scale up your job? How are we going to give you more responsibility or change your responsibilities or the way we measure your, your performance? Whatever it is, we have to have that clearly defined or else people, they, they tend to assume the worst. Again, not because we're all negative, but because if I don't have information, I can put two and two together. If you're automating half my job, no one's telling me what's going to happen to the other half of my job, I have to assume that you might eliminate my position. And so you've got to think about, think that through and paint that vision of what the org design is, what the processes are going to look like, and what people's roles and responsibilities are going to be. Because otherwise, I can tell you AI will just sit there, it'll become the next big buzzword that, that flopped because it ended up being shelfware and organizations didn't end up using it. And you know, because of inertia and the status quo, people will eventually want to revert back to the way they've always done things. So, so we've got to fight that inertia and uh, make sure we pave a clear path and paint a clear vision for, for team members. We've got to communicate benefits, manage the expectations. We need people bought in. I mean, we need, we need buy-in in order for this to succeed. I think the good thing with AI is so many people are hyper-focused on it, um, from the boardroom all the way down to shop floor workers. So that, that's um, pretty exciting to see. I think a lot of investors and board members are sort of forcing organizations to consider AI because it helps the valuation of the, a lot of organizations. So because of that, I think it's easier to get a little alignment than perhaps it might have been with ERP systems. I think in the past, people thought of ERP as a necessary evil or a high-risk endeavor, high-cost endeavor that people weren't a lot of times real excited about having to do. It was sort of a necessary thing they had to do. But with AI, there's a different strategic focus and a strategic urgency that I think is actually going to help organizations get that buy-in and get that momentum, uh, perhaps in a way they haven't in the past. So just real quickly, some of the challenges and ethical considerations um, you know, we have to think about this Terminator effect. And what I mean by the Terminator effect, again, that's one of my favorite movies growing up. Um, we have to recognize that, you know, we have to control AI. We can't let AI control us. We can't let AI make major decisions for us. We can't relegate responsibility to AI. We, we as humans still have to do our jobs. We still have to provide the direction and the validation of whatever it is we're getting out of AI. So we need, to, we need to understand that, and also we need to combat the fear of AI. As I mentioned before, people are inevitably going to be afraid of AI um, because of some of the threat it poses. Um, and again, you have to think about those people. I, I imagine a lot of you have people like this in your organization that have survived through heroics and tribal knowledge. How many of you have that, at least that one person, that one guy, that one gal that just, they've been there for 30 years, They've got all these spreadsheets and convoluted but effective ways of doing things, and no one knows how it works except for that one person. Does anyone have that person or more than one in their organization? So a lot of you. So, and maybe you've got 10, maybe you've got 100 of them, I don't know. But the point is, if, you, if, you, if you're that person, that's a big threat to say, well, I've, been, I've gotten by and, and made my name here at this organization by being the hero. I mean, despite all the crappy systems and the lack of data, I'm able to make it happen. I'm able to patch it all together, and I've got all the stuff in my head that I, I know about the company. No one knows the business like I do. And if all of a sudden now that becomes not true because now AI can do it better than I ever did it and faster than I ever did it, that's a threat to me, even though it's the best thing for the organization most likely. So we've got to recognize that and figure out how we overcome that. We also have to understand AI biases and hallucinations. There's still hallucinations in AI. I know whenever one thing that drives me crazy is I use AI a lot. Actually, I use ChatGPT every day for content creation. I do it to create graphics to, for presentations and things of that nature. And it drives me crazy that uh, when I try to put text on a, on a um, uh, graphic that comes out of uh, ChatGPT, there's, there's always errors in the, in, the gra in the text. The graphic will be exactly what I want, but the text is wrong. So there's things like that that, you know, AI is not perfect. There's still problems with it. It's information you get from ChatGPT or AI models is not going to be 100% accurate, especially as it's learning your business and when you first roll it out. So it takes time for it to learn. And if anyone who's used ChatGPT from the beginning has probably noticed that ChatGPT has gotten a lot better. Um, I, just to share my content creation, I, I used to write one blog a week and now I write four to five a week because I use ChatGPT to do it. And the, I've been doing it for a while now, but it's so much different now to where I rarely have to change anything on the AI-generated blog because it's exactly what I want, because it's, it's learned what I'm looking for, and I base it on my YouTube video. So I take my YouTube video, the transcript, and I use it to create a blog. I tell it to change some things and add some points here and there, and it, it, I don't have to rewrite stuff. So it's, it's come a long way, but it's still not there yet. There's still times where I get a blog and there's something wrong with it. It's not what I said. It's not what I meant in the video. And so I have to go correct that uh, in the blog. So 
one tiny example of how you still have to be aware that AI is not perfect and it may never be perfect. And then for that reason, the human perspective is important. So we have to recognize you know, how humans interact and what their jobs entail, what kind of governance we put in place for AI is gonna be critical. So the last thing I'll cover, and then we'll, we'll answer any questions you have with the last few minutes we have, um, how do we move forward with AI? What, what are some things we can do now to get started? Because it can be overwhelming. I know we talk a lot about it in this conference. I don't think I've been in a session yet that didn't talk or bring up AI within the first three to five minutes. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to talk about technology now without talking about AI. And, but it can be overwhelming because what does it mean? We can't, we're not just gonna become an AI-driven organization overnight, so what do we do? So I think there's some incremental steps you can be taking. One is to clean up your data and make sure your data is ready. And again, this is not just for AI, it's also gonna help you through your ERP initiative, whether you're implementing a new ERP system or whether you're just trying to get more value out of your old system or both. Uh, data, data readiness is gonna, is gonna help you there. Um, and by the way, part of data readiness is also creating a data-driven culture and data govern, and incorporating data governance into your day-to-day -day operation. So that's part of what I mean by data readiness as well. Because we don't wanna just clean up the data and then have the same broken processes and the same flawed human inter interactions that are disrupting or impacting the data negatively. There's a, word, there's a better word than that, but I think you know what I mean making the data less accurate. Um, so you wanna make sure it's, it's, uh, you've got the processes and the expectations and the awareness in place to, to keep the data in good shape. You also wanna make sure you have um, the right partners helping you. And I think you know, here's an opportunity to move beyond the three or traditional big ERP system integrator and look at organizations that are innovative, that have an understanding of emerging technologies and different ways that you might use technology um, to, to enable your, your uh, business goals and objectives. Shameless self-promotion, third stage consulting is one of those possible options that you might consider for your, for your partner selection. Uh, strategic governance, that's another thing you've got to think about is uh, the, the program management, how you're going to integrate data, how you're going to manage risks, how you're going to manage data privacy. That's something else we've got to think about is what happens with the data when it goes into an a, a AI model. Um, is it still ours? Is it still confidential? Um, are we revealing confidential information that's now being accessed by competitors? Those are all things we've got to think about, especially with data privacy laws emerging throughout the world, especially in Europe, uh, to start. And then we've also got to navigate the technological, lands technological landscape. There's so many different options with AI. You know, obviously, Epcor is investing heavily in AI, as we discussed, but you also have a lot of upstart uh, startup types of AI uh, software companies that are out there offering all kinds of different capabilities using AI. In fact, a lot of them are here. A lot of the, the partners and sponsors and exhibitors here are using AI, and, and some of them are AI-based uh, software organizations as well. I'll share these slides with you too, to anyone that wants them, so you can take a picture of this one if you want. This is usually one that people want to look at, but this is sort of how to, sort of a roadmap for defining a digital strategy, including AI. This, and actually, I would say this is a, a, a framework you might want to use not just for AI, but for your ERP project, your overall digital transformation. You'd want to fit whatever technology or technologies you're looking at, you'd want to incorporate into, um, into, into this roadmap here. And the key, I won't go through it all. I'm happy to walk through it with you offline in more detail to anyone who's interested. But the key here is to recognize that there's a lot more than just technology here that we've got to think about. We've got to think about business processes and what our future state's going to look like. We need to think about the organizational impact and how people's jobs are going to uh, change, um, what the org design is going to be, what roles and responsibilities are going to be going forward, and then what are the enterprise apps that are going to enable this? Is it one core ERP system? Is it best of breed? Is it, are we just going to rely on AI that's in Epicor or in whatever ERP system we have? Are we looking for third-party AI tools? Those are all questions that we need to answer and have a clear roadmap for. We also have to look at the solution architecture, how, how systems tie together, how data flows, how we're going to get the data into the AI models. Uh, we've got to think about BI and analytics, which obviously is very, very much correlated or, or tied to uh, AI, but just having that visibility into your organization and your operations and being able to access it uh, using AI is another important aspect. And then, of course, project quality assurance to make sure your project stays on track. So that's, that's hopefully some ways to start thinking about how we can actually start the journey towards AI, and hopefully that shared some, some insights as to how organizations are, are starting to to uh, take advantage of some of the capabilities uh, within AI. 
Um, I'll open it to questions now, um, and I'm happy to stay after because I know we're up against time right now. I'll stay here. I'm, in fact, I'm presenting here again in 10 minutes. I have nowhere to go, so I'll be here. Um, but in the meantime, as we uh, wrap up, uh, if you scan that QR code right there, there's a resource center on our website. You can get a ton of free downloads, uh, white papers, digital strategy type stuff. You can follow me on YouTube as well. If you don't follow me on YouTube, you can do that here. Just search Eric Kimberling on, on uh, YouTube. You can find me there. I put out three to four videos a week on ERP, AI, tech agnostic, stuff like that. So um, anyway, I hope this is helpful. Um, I'll take any questions you have these last couple minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Any, any other questions or things we didn't cover that you hoped we would? That's a great question. So single, uh, single ear, or question is, what about AI as a standalone versus AI embedded into like an ERP system? Yeah. So AI does have the potential to give you some immediate value on legacy systems if you're in a best of breed environment. So it does provide an option or a possibility of gathering data from multiple sources and analyzing it. So there is um, some low hanging fruit there. So I, I don't know that the one's better than the other, but I think it is an option to use a standalone AI to rely on your legacy systems. The, the one downside limitation is gonna be you just don't have the same access to, to mass amounts of data via the cloud if, if you haven't moved to the cloud. So it's, it's a good short-term interim benef uh, potential advantage, but I wouldn't suggest it as a long-term strategy necessarily. But if you're going through a two or three year implementation, you could use it as a way to get value right now with what you've got.